What should I do with my tight end position this year? Do I really need to draft Travis Kelsey in the middle of the first round? What if I don't get Travis Kelsey, or even George Kittle or Darren Waller? What other options do I have? In this video, we talk about all this and more. What's up, everybody? We are back with another episode of Fantasy Football 201, an advice show on my channel geared to helping you win a fantasy football championship. I picked 201 because 101 was not available. It was already taken by somebody else. So in this video, we will talk about tight end strategy and what you should do for the tight end position in fantasy football. If you're interested in more content on my channel, please check it out. I make a wide variety of videos, not just fantasy football. If you're interested in any of that, please check out the description below. But now we will get into the tight end position for fantasy football in 2021. So tight end is a very frustrating position for a lot of people in fantasy football because there are a few elite tight ends that are excellent options for you to have, but then after that, there is a very steep drop-off, and you're sifting between a lot of players who perform not only relatively about the same by the end of the season, but their output week by week is also very inconsistent. So, to illustrate this, I'm going to uh, just take you through the average, or the, uh, excuse me, the performances over the last three years in terms of fantasy football tight ends which will be displayed here as well. So you can see just how significant the drop-off is between the elite tight ends and the rest of the tight ends in the NFL. So we go all the way back to 2018, where we start this off. We look at some trends that have been going on since 2018. And if you notice here, Travis Kelsey was the number one tight end in 2018 with 287 points. Um, You'll notice that is a very consistent trend as we go through this, Travis Kelsey being at the top. Then it was Zach Ertz at 274, George Kittle 252, drop off a little bit to Eric Ebron and Jared Cook, and then things really start falling off. You get Austin Hooper, Kyle Rudolph, and then you're all the way down by the time you get to the number 10 tight end, Rob Gronkowski, into the 120. So this continues in 2019. Again, Travis Kelsey at the top of this list. He had 248 points last in uh, 2019. Number two, Darren Waller, 216. And then you had a couple tight ends that did pretty well right around that range. George Kittle, Zach Ertz, Mark Andrews. Austin Hooper did okay, but then things start dropping off again right around that 6 to 10 range. You're all the way down to, at number 10, you've got a score of 140, which is over 100 points less than Travis Kelsey. 2020, it's even worse. And a lot of this is because George Kittle was injured and Zach Ertz has been uh, um, past his prime a little bit, for lack of better words. Travis Kelsey, 306 points, easily surpassing his numbers from previously. Darren Waller put up excellent numbers as well. And then after that, it was a drop-off of almost 100 points to Logan Thomas, Robert Tanyan, uh, TJ Hawkinson, and Mark Andrews did Decently well, but then things start continue to drop off further, and you're back into the 140s when you get into the round, the range of tight end number 10, which is, again, half the value of what Travis Kelsey scored. So my overall point in bringing this up is that there are very few tight ends that put up excellent value, and then if you you don't get one of them, then it's essentially the same situation as kickers, where you're you're having to sift through a lot of guys that are performing relatively about the same. And then to make matters worse, a lot of these players that you have in a tight end position that are performing right around the 150s to 140s to 130s, they're not doing it consistently either. They have some games where they have 10 points, 15 points, and other games where they do not score at all. So you are essentially stuck in a situation where you're having to rely on guys that are just wildly inconsistent. And this is thus why a lot of people go the streaming route in tight ends. So is there a preferred method to have in terms of having Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Darren Waller, or one of the elite tight ends, or to just go off the stream? So it's a little more complicated than that. So there are three options that you can basically go. One is to get one of those elite tight ends, and you're going to have to take them relatively high. Travis Kelsey, we're going to get into this a little later, but he's going to be a first-round pick. 
George Kittle and Darren Waller are going to be third round picks probably. And this is because they are going to be, they're not only great at their, at their position and at putting up points, but relative to everybody else, it creates a huge need for them that you wouldn't typically have uh, if, if, let's say, they were wide receivers performing at that value. So it, it is very important to make sure that you plan out, if you're going to take one of these three players, what you're going to do is in terms of filling your other positions, in terms of your pass catchers and running backs. The other route you can take is to try to pick a young rising tight end, somebody who looks like they've got a bright future ahead of them, and could eventually one day become one of those elite tight ends or put up numbers that give you great value um, even compared to the rest of the tight ends because they're a young tight end that's in a developing system where they're going to um, have a lot of opportunity. We'll get into this a little more later, but some examples of guys that are worth considering in this situation are TJ Hawkinson, um, Got, there's various opinion on Kyle Pitts, but people can say that he could fall into this category as well. Noah Fant could be considered one of those guys. Um, Hunter Henry, he's getting a little older, but he's in a new opportunity in New England. Guys like Evan Ingram are always thrown into that mix as well. Guys like that are, are also ways that you can go too. But the third way that you go, and this is, I think if you end up in a situation where you've drafted a tight end, that you thought had upside, but he's just not showing it, then you have to go this route. And you just basically, you have to commit to a stream until you can find somebody that you actually can rely upon. And unfortunately, more often than not, when you're drafting, when you're trying to take strategy number two and going after a young rising tight end, a lot of times you do find yourself in the position of uh, having to go the stream route anyway. Great example of this is OJ Howard. Everybody was always hyping O.J. Howard as always going to be the next breakout tight end, but he just it just never clicked for him. And it, it, to make matters worse, last season he was injured, and now he sits at third on the depth chart behind uh, Rob Gronkowski and Cameron Brait. So there, guys like that, if you really went all in on O.J. Howard, then you would have had to gone the streaming route anyway. So in this video, I'm going to take you through... Uh, how you should ideally approach these three strategies and what you should do in terms of setting up your tight end position to be successful. So overall, when I get to my strategy, the key point that I want to make is that I am still focusing on building my running back and wide receiver depth primarily. Now, as I talked about in, the, in previous videos, um, in terms of running backs and wide receivers, you're playing two running backs, two wide receivers, and a flex, which is almost certainly going to be either a wide receiver or a running back. So all that being said, for running backs and wide receivers, you're filling five positions of those two, or five slots of those two positions every week. For the tight end, you're generally only having one, unless you decide to, to do the flex tight end, but I would highly advise against that, and I'm going to go through why. But all that being said, because you're filling so many more positions every week that of, of guys that are going to give you points for wide receivers and running backs, you are trying to prioritize building your roster around those two positions. And tight ends, it's, it's one of those that you have to look out for to make sure you have a, one that you can rely upon, but you do not want to cost yourself great wide receivers and running backs reaching for a tight end. So... In summary, the way I go through my strategy is uh, kind of step by step. So I generally, I start by building a draft board up at the top. And this is primarily geared towards Travis Kelsey. But how are you going to rank him compared to the other running backs and wide receivers? Um, then what I'll do is, and, and you could extend this out into the third round as well, because that's going to likely include George Kittle and Darren Waller. And then when you have your board the next step is that you want to take either Kelsey, Waller, or Kittle if they are still available on that board and you're not reaching over players that you like more. It's it's kind of, it, it seems a little uh, redundant to have to explain this as steps, but it is very important because if you don't really think about who you prioritize over those tight ends, then you could find yourself panicking and then just reaching for one and costing yourself 
a player if you haven't really put your, the thought into it in advance. If all three of them are gone, though, and you didn't draft them, then you start looking for tight end depth, but you do it depending on the strength and comfort level that you already have at the present time of, of getting to a tight end of that round of your running back and wide receiver depth. So that being said, people are going to start reaching for tight ends after the top three leave. And you're going to have some guys that are overreaching for some of these players that really should not be drafted as high as they are. I'm almost positive that somebody is going to take Kyle Pitts extremely high. But I caution against that because tight ends are very... Um, they're slow to adjust to the NFL offense. You look at TJ Hawkinson in his rookie year, um, had a lot of rough games. And he was a guy that was also a top 10 pick who was projected to be the next Gronk, much like people are kind of saying Kyle Pitts is. But you have to be careful because they might be disappointing relative to the level of hype they're going to get. And that's my fear with somebody like Kyle Pitts. Um, so take a tight end. When they come up on the board, if they have some good value, if you feel that you are in a good position with your running backs and wide receivers, that you can afford taking them. Um, then my other strategy, I've already kind of talked about this, is again, just don't reach for those players if you don't feel that you have the right depth at running back and wide receiver at the time. And quarterback as well is another position you have to consider in this too. Um, watch my quarterback video. It's in the description below if you want to see more on that. Um, but yeah, so how would you employ this on the tight end landscape? So here I have for you the ADP projection for tight ends in the 2021 season. And we start at the top with Travis Kelsey because he's pretty much in a tier of his own. And with Travis Kelsey, one of the things that stands out for him is that he actually, people... People say, well, you know, he's performing well for a tight end. But if you look at his numbers from last season, with 306 points, he would have placed as the number three wide receiver based on his performance. The only people who outperformed him were Devontae Adams and Stephon Diggs. And then, right after that, Travis Kelsey came right up on the board. So, you're essentially getting an elite wide receiver at the tight end position with Travis Kelsey. Then you add on the top that of that that he's in the tight end position and he's extremely better than anybody else at tight end. And he's in the Kansas City Chiefs offense where he's essentially a 1A, 1B with uh, Tyreek Hill for targets from Patrick Mahomes. And it makes sense why this guy is prioritized as high as he is. So personally for me, when I place Travis Kelsey on my board, I have him um, at number seven on my board. So the guys that I have at the top, and you can kind of refer to my running back list as well, four running backs, Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, and Derrick Henry. Then my fifth player is Devontae Adams at wide receiver. I have him at number five. I think he's excellent value for wide receiver given his connection with Aaron Rodgers. Then I go Saquon Barkley at six. And then I put a lot of thought into this as well in between Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill as number seven or eight. But ultimately, because of the tight end shortages, um, I personally would rather have Travis Kelsey than Tyreek Hill. But you can make an argument for either or. But essentially, what I would do then is that, you know, you're, let's say you're drafting fourth and you still have one of your guys on the board higher, like let's say Alvin Kamara is still available, then I would still draft Kamara. I would not spend that on um, Travis Kelsey. But I would do something like that because let's say you're drafting 10th and Travis Kelsey is still available, then I would definitely try to get Travis Kelsey. The next tight ends up on the list here are George Kittle and Darren Waller. And much like the same with Travis Kelsey, as I said, I prioritize these guys as third round players that are relatively around 30 to 35 on my board. So if I'm in a position where um, you know I've drafted a good RB1, a good wide receiver one, and then I get to the end of the third round and then George Kittle is still available. That is excellent value. I would take George Kittle in that situation. So it, it, it's you can't just totally frame it one way or the other in terms of whether or not uh, I, you have to take one of these people in one of these rounds because a lot of it depends on who is still available because people are going to fall 
on the draft board and somebody is still available that you like, then I would still go with the people you like over somebody like George Kill or Darren Waller. Later on, so there's a couple tight ends that I like that I want to talk about in terms of their average draft position available. I'm going to kind of go down the list of guys that stand out for me of people that I would like to for somebody like you to take if you're considering them. So people I like. So I like, I know Mark Andrews had a difficult season last year, but I do like him to have a bounce back season with Baltimore. I think um, Lamar Jackson is definitely trying to improve on his weaknesses as a pass, passer, try to get guys more involved on, in the receiving core to balance the offense. And Mark Andrews is a guy that's had consistency there, who is the more consistent option for Baltimore in terms of his value. And, you know, when he, he had a rough start to the season last year, but he did play better as the season went along. I suspect that he will continue to build on that momentum. TJ Hawkinson I also really like. I like TJ Hawkinson more than Andrews and Pitts, personally, the way they're displayed on this board, because I think Hawkinson, not only did he have a bounce-back season last year and he has a lot of potential that he continued to build off of, but Detroit does not have much else in terms of other options. You've got... Uh, Kenny Galladay went to the Giants. Marvin Jones went to the Jaguars. They've got a lot of other receivers on the team now that have mostly had inconsistent careers like Tyrell Williams. So I think this is going to be a great opportunity for TJ Hawkinson to shine on a team that desperately needs him to. Other players I like on this list, I think Noah Fant has value. I think people are sleeping on him a little bit because he hasn't quite put it together yet. But he does have good rapport with Drew Locke, and if Drew Locke ends up being the starter, I think that this will really help Fant's value. The key is he needs to stay healthy. Two other guys I like here at 11 and 12, Tyler Higby and Hunter Henry. I think both of them are really benefiting from changes in, in their offensive system. Um, Tyler Higby, for example, Jared Everett, Gerald, Gerald, excuse me, Gerald Everett, sorry, I don't want to butcher that so much, but he is in Seattle now, and the Rams primarily ran a two tight end offense where both of them were relatively successful at times. I think Higby will get a lot of those targets that used to go to Gerald Everett. And especially with, with uh, Cam Akers being injured, expect more passing and short passes. Hunter Henry, I think, and I've, I've talked a lot about Hunter Henry a lot in my videos, but I think this is perfect value for New England. I think that he's going to have a lot of opportunity there. My only fear is that Jonu Smith could take some of his receptions away, but I think Henry has a lot more upside. And personally, I think that you know this is a guy that we've always wanted to see because of the potential he has. And if he stays healthy, I think he's really going to take advantage of that opportunity in New England. Other guys I like here at the bottom of the list, Irv Smith, I think is great value for Minnesota. Um, he would be an excellent pickup. And then guys that aren't listed here that I think are also very good value to get late, Gerald Everett, who I just talked about going to Seattle, he'll definitely have opportunity there. Russell Wilson actually did a good job getting tight ends involved in the past. And then Blake Jarwin, coming off an injury for Dallas, he's really going to have a lot of opportunity. Dalton Schultz, his backup, was a top 10 tight end last year. Guys that I don't like very much on this list that I would be cautious about. So um, Dallas Goddard, I think that he... The most success that he's shown in the NFL is when he was playing alongside Zach Ertz. And I think a lot of this is because Ertz was more productive at the time, took some of the tension away from the defense. But since Goddard has mostly been on his own, he hasn't exactly been productive. Or as productive as we would hope he would be. Not only that, but Philadelphia's offense is not expected to be very good. If there's potential that he could get some more targets with Jalen Hurts being there, but he didn't exactly favor Dallas Goddard um, over some of his other pass-catching options. So I'm just cautious about him going high. Right below him, Logan Thomas, I'm also not a great fan of because Logan Thomas was very much, to me, a one-hit wonder who had a great season last season because of Alex Smith's affinity for tight ends. I don't think that will apply with um, Ryan Fitzpatrick, who much more prefers to get receivers involved. And then other guys... And I think this just goes without saying, just do not draft Rob Gronkowski. He is the, the definition of a guy that's going to go high because of his hype value, but will not give you anything in terms of the number of... I, I, I just don't, I don't see it. I, I would be 
honestly, what I would be more comfortable taking OJ Howard off waivers and seeing what he can do with that because it doesn't cost you a pick than potentially reaching for Gronk in the 12th round or something like that, which is where people are projecting that he goes. I just don't do it. I'm just giving you that forewarning. All right. Well, that's all I got on tight ends. If you're interested in more videos like this, please check out my channel. I have a wide variety of fantasy football content, including uh, strategy videos about the tight end, or the, excuse me, the kicker, the quarterback, and the running back. So check that out on my channel. I also got team previews and mock drafts too. So let me know what you think. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.